very nice introduction. Uh, thank you for coming. I am excited actually to share our work um, and share my passion on uh, basically what I'm saying here, learning from the Gothic master builders. And I want to share a little bit the insights that we gained through looking at uh, what these people could do and knowledge that we actually lost. And I'll try to show you how exciting it is to actually uh, discover these kind of uh, lost techniques, these lost methods, this lost intuition, and to, tr to try to design better perhaps, or at least design differently. So for this, I, um, I will ask you to bear with me for about five minutes because I want to sh uh, show you where our work comes from. So we actually, uh, I did my PhD with John Oxendorf at MIT on the equilibrium analysis of historic structures in masonry. Uh, and I'll share why I think this is a relevant topic. Uh, but then more importantly, so once I sketch where this, this comes from, then I will show how from the understanding we can actually uh, develop new graphical methods to design exciting forms. And then I'll show you a numer uh, really numerous examples. In fact, I might bombard you a little bit with what you can do with these kind of approaches. And at the end, I hope to surprise you that we can actually learn from masonry, from unreinforced masonry, well beyond uh, a literal translation. And so there I uh, hope to extend and kind of hint at the possibilities to push these kind of ideas further. But so let's start with the equilibrium analysis of historic masonry. This was one of the projects that John uh, showed me when I arrived. And I expected to do high-tech things when I went to e uh, uh, MIT. I almost said ETH there, but that is then also the MIT of Europe, I guess. Um, but uh, these structures were actually surprisingly high-tech when you start to look at them more carefully. So these, perhaps you recognize these, these beautiful fan vaults at the University of Cambridge, uh, King's College. They're unreinforced, so that means there is no, uh, no steel, no carbon fiber, nothing helping them to stand other than just their shape being kept nicely in compression. Uh, the span is about 13 meters, and the shell goes from about 10 centimeters in the middle to 15 centimeters at the end. If this doesn't mean anything to you, perhaps this image might clarify the audacity of the builders at the time. They basically build a structure with no redundancy, just large pieces of stone kept together in compression that were as thin as an eggshell, whatever the span is of an eggshell, right? Another, another reason why I am uh, passionate to work on these structures is that uh, uh, this is an example from the 60s, but unfortunately this happens still all over the world, that these structures are, not, are still poorly understood how they stand and here what we actually witness in this image is um, a, a tile vault, a Guastavino tile vault at the Metropolitan Museum in New York uh, that is replaced by a beam structure because the engineer didn't know how to uh, explain how long these structures would stand. This additionally dramatic or particularly dramatic was that they had to be taken down with jackhammers that maybe might have given a clue that these structures are very uh, that they behave very well. And perhaps they should have looked at the load test that the Guastavinos did. There is indeed a little shell hidden under this pile of uh, 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 iron, iron pieces. And uh, just showing again that these kind of beautiful doubly curved shells uh, have an inherent uh, load bearing capacity. So, um, Again, explaining a little bit where all of this comes from. We, modern engineering, or uh, at least most of the engineering uh, done today is focusing on stress, on stress distribution, if we look at finite element analyses. And these kind of problems are not scalable, as we see with the, the bone of a dog compared, of the, uh, compared to the, do, uh, the bone of uh, an elephant. Uh, luckily for the master builders in the Gothic and even earlier, masonry is predominantly a problem of equilibrium and stability, and that also means then of good geometry. That meant that well before theory of structures, they could actually just uh, use proportional rules. If something worked at a certain scale, then they could scale it up and it would still work uh, the same. So that is a nice property that was a, a luck for them that they actually could look mainly on good, uh, good uh, geometry. 
Uh, they also looked at uh, structural models, so they actually uh, used wooden or other types of models to explain uh, the stability or to explore the stability of these structures. And I'll show you that we are now bringing back these kind of approaches to have a more appropriate way to look at them. Indeed, now we have a theoretical framework to look uh, to explain the stability of unreinforced masonry and more specifically the idea of a truss line. This is a theoretical line that visualizes or explains where the forces want to flow. And actually Hyman in, at the University of Cambridge had uh, translated this within the limit analysis framework that basically you need to find one possible solution that stays on the inside of your section and that is sufficient to say that the structure is stable. Very powerful idea certainly to deal with uh, structures where you absolutely have no idea of the material qualities, the stiffness distribution, the exact boundary conditions, so something that you really need to put in any modern uh, engineering tool. Um, one way to generate such a truss line is, I hope most of you are familiar with the idea of as hangs the flexible line, so but inverted will stand a rigid arch. So that basically means that if you have a certain loading condition and you have a flexible string, so without bending capacity, in pure tension, if you freeze this geometry and you flip it over, then this will be, from a static standpoint, be a pure compression uh, uh, state. Very powerful, but very painful to make hanging models. And indeed, Gaudi used 10 years to design his Sagrada. Uh, no, this is the Parc Goel, um, uh, this hanging model uh, with an expert team. There was an issue a little bit with control because the sandbags had to be proportional to the weight of the structure to be expected and every move shifted around. And uh, I don't have to convince you that uh, our clients nowadays might not be willing to wait 10 years for your grant uh, design to arrive. So that's perhaps something uh, where we can still improve. Um, for these kind of three-dimensional structures, what we developed without going in too much detail is we then uh, are able to give a certain surface and to that surface, in this case the middle surface of the shell, we map a pure compression solution that balances all the loads. So this is a possible way that this vault can stand and we developed this uh, with, with some uh, graphical methods but I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit more afterwards. But equally as important than just static equilibrium is also masonry, because it's a stability problem, is large displacements is a key issue. And for this we developed this lab at ETH where we use very precise 3D printed models that we then start to apply differential settlements to the supports to understand the relationship between those and three-dimensional collapse, but also to understand and to develop new numerical methods to understand all of this better. All right, this is a very dry start, but I just want to show that this is really what we do. This is where it comes from. This is what I typically do professionally, but now the exciting part is how we can translate this understanding and to really start to design with this kind of understanding of full three-dimensional balancing of, uh, in this case, large pieces of stone. So to give you an example, let's for example, yeah, okay, twice for example. Uh, let's for example look uh, at this design problem. Let's say that we want to span a space in compression. If we follow the compression forces, then the stresses are very low, so you can really reduce the, the material. And let's say that we want a full circular support. So all of you can say, well, that is a dome, maybe a dome with an oculus, a dome with several openings. Well, in fact, there is really an infinite number of solutions that can solve this problem in pure compression. So these were actually all generated with uh, the tool that we developed and we were using also in the class today. So how to then start to judge or to, to compare these solutions beyond aesthetics? And that's where graphic statics, I don't know if uh, some of you are familiar with graphic statics, it's a lost kind of technique of both combining design and analysis. And when we look in graphic statics, what we have is we are not only concerned with the geometry, but we also have in the same method, we have the equilibrium of forces in it. So we have a visual representation, a very explicit visualization of the relationship between geometry and uh, force equilibrium. That works in 2D, and so we have extended this into 3D. This is this tool, Rhino Vault. It's a plugin for Rhino. And to the left, uh, you will see just a layout of forces. 
you can just decide where the forces want to flow in 3D. To the right, you have a diagram that represents the equilibrium of the forces in the system. And more specifically, the length of every element represents the magnitude of force in it. And so this we will then use to start the design. So here, this, this case is, of course, inspired by the British Museum in London, at least uh, formally. But if you then literally start to attract forces, so you ask the structure to basically attract more force in a certain direction, then we will have a more shallow structure in this direction. All of you understand this, because if you have a hanging chain and you have a very deep structure, then you don't have to pull much uh, outwards. If you want to have a very shallow structure or you want the cable to be very straight, then you need to pull much more for the same weight. So we do the inverse. We tell the structure, pull more or push more in this direction, and you allow basically to sculpt uh, uh, 3D equilibrium. We developed this tool as a little bit of a painful tool because it forces the designer not to focus just on geometry. It's, it's not a black box solver where you push and it gives you the best solution, but the designer needs to work with it and needs to start to, like in this case, um, uh, when you play with the boundary conditions, uh, you see uh, very exciting structures emerge. This is inspired by Stuttgart 21. I don't know if you know this project, but it is supposed to be a thin concrete shell. It ends up being uh, basically a steel structure with some concrete cladding. Perhaps they should have hired the block research group to uh, design Stuttgart 21. Oh, shoot, I forgot I'm being taped. Yeah, all right. Uh, doesn't matter. Um, all right. So, but to come back to the, stat, uh, the example that I had there, uh, here, this is, these are some results. And so what we see on the bottom row is basically the, the distribution of horizontal forces. So at a glance, you see what it takes to make certain decisions. What does it take to attract forces in a certain direction and how are you distributing all the loads? All right, so let's now see how we can use this uh, in design. So the first step is that if we follow the, the, the flow of forces, then we basically can design very low, low, uh, with very low quality or little materials because the stresses will be very low. And I'll demonstrate this in several uh, masonry projects. To the left is a traditional way that we all know for, from, from historic structures. In full centering, you place the elements and then you decenter. The middle one is uh, a Mexican technique. And uh, to the right, we have tile vaulting. And the latter two have the benefit that you can actually build the space without the need of any formwork. So that has a huge advantage. But let's first look at tile vaulting. Tile vaulting actually works by basically first having the boundary conditions as fixed, and then you build in stable sections using a fast setting mortar. So that is the trick, that it is a gypsum-based mortar. And this first uh, layer is then used as a lost formwork to build up the structural depth uh, in layers in different uh, um, uh, orientations. There's many beautiful examples in the United States. Uh, here in the Bronx Zoo, uh, perhaps you know the Oyster Bar in Grand Central Terminal. I want to emphasize here that this was built without any formwork. This is an unreinforced shell of only 15 centimeters thick, and this is actually the shell that is carrying the Vanderbilt Hall above, right? So this is what you can do when you understand good structural form and you combine it with such a technique. But again, many more beautiful structures, all in New York, and I particularly like these shell structures. Again, built without any formwork, they're only two layers thick, so that means about eight centimeters, they're unreinforced, and they're basically, as you see in the load test, they, they form these beautiful, very uh, robust structures. No surprise that the Guastavinos did all this awesome stuff because they were indeed masters of graphic statics. As, for example, Robert Maillard, as uh, Gustav Eiffel, as so many other designers from those uh, golden ages. Well, just a little call for John, John Oxendorf's beautiful book, uh, awesome coffee table book. If you want to know anything about the Guastavino Falls, this is the one to get. All right, but so how do we translate this? Uh, the first project that I was involved with still during my uh, PhD was the Mapungube 
uh, Interpretation Center in South Africa, a project by Peter Rich with John Oxendorf and Michael Ramage. Uh, the exciting thing about the project that it, is that it was a very distant site, so, uh, and it was basically a poverty relief program, so it had to be done with local people, capacity building, technology transfer, and because of the site also with as much local materials as possible. So um, this meant that actually one year in advance, uh, uh, just using uh, compressed uh, soil tiles, so uh, uh, one, uh, 12 people were employed. So on the top right, perhaps a nice little anecdote, uh, these ladies are not only having uh, fun on the building site, it's also interesting that they are carrying the tiles to the building site because the uh, these, these, these tiles were basically optimized for compression. Uh, they only could take two megapascals, which is basically peanuts. But more importantly, and more scarily in fact, is that these 25 centimeter tiles, if you held them on one side, they would just snap in bending. So that is why the women are carrying them, because if the men were carrying those the first couple of days, more than half of the tiles were broken by the time they arrived on site. In the bottom left, you see Michael Ramage and James Bellany, our master mason, teaching what basically a week before were carpenters and, and uh, farmers and the local people. So very exciting, the low threshold of these kind of uh, techniques. So here you see what happened then. Very traditional tile vaulting. First, the boundary conditions are built on phone work. And then with just a minimal amount of guide work, well, in fact, here, this is a lot of guide work uh, compared to typical tile vaulting. Uh, the first layer can be set just without any support. So we needed a little bit of guide work. I told you the weakness of the tiles. So with this low skilled or actually non-skilled laborers, we had to be very careful to trace the geometry and to stick to the, to the shape. Because these are just soil tiles, only 7% uh, to uh, stabilize uh, them. Um, the first rain would kind of uh, mean disaster, so we had to waterproof this very carefully. And then an architectural uh, a decision to put these stones on top, which actually helps us, because then we have a very dominant self-weight that nicely keeps the compression forces stable throughout the life of the structure. So here again showing that this first layer is built uh, with lost formwork and to the right you see how thin actually even these weak tiles can be and directly the next mason can start to lay the other layers. And then here um, beautiful integration in the landscape and these kind of images helped me a lot to do, uh, to do follow up projects in, in an African context because people in Africa are sick of the Westerners or the Northerners coming with cheap solutions that look incredibly cheap and ugly. And so they constantly ask, would you want to live in what you, what you design? And so these things to me are very beautiful. And here we look at an 18 meter span. Uh, this is a five layer, so 20 centimeters about of structural depth, so literally dirt cheap uh, shells in South Africa. Uh, as one of my first projects at ETH, we translated this and we went even beyond uh, to address in Ethiopia to address basically these kind of low cost housing. There's nothing low cost about this, only the non-subsidized part is perhaps in the low cost, uh, cost bracket because everything here needs to be, uh, um, uh, needs to be imported. Uh, the Ethiopians don't have cement, now they start having cement, they don't have reinforcement steel, they don't have precision wood for the formwork and so on. So this is very expensive just to mimic our building pra paradigm. So using a uh, tin tile vault, again with weak tiles to, as a lost formwork, this was still in the South Af uh, Africa project. That means that you can do a concrete floor without, without any reinforcement. But we wanted to go one step further. So we looked at the Guastavinos and they had this floor system where they stiffened their thin shell either with spandrel walls or with a stabilized fill. And why is that necessary? Well, the vault is perfect for a uniform load, but as soon as you have a point load, then the forces want to go outside of the section. And that is why you need these stiffeners to basically allow these different thrust lines to stick within the geometry. So this was a model, so we had the hanging chain uh, hanging in front of the building site. This was Lara Davis teaching local laborers uh, to build this structure. Uh, this was a fairly long project because it is actually the cultural kind of barriers are not to be underestimated and you need to really 
follow this up. I really believe that too many people are going there with their grand idea and leave too soon. You need to train people on all the levels. As you don't want to build in this kind of weak materials in a seismic area, you also need to understand the materials. So this had to go together with experts that understood the materials. And here you see what we do. A single curvature shell is not a good structural form, so we need to stiffen it. So here you see the stiffness and then we stabilize, we filled it with uh, a lime stabilized pumice so that at the end you basically have one large package where compressive forces can go through. And this is the result after uh, the, the, the stair was done by a local mason. For the top floor, because we wanted to optimize the depth of the floor in between, we, we squeezed it with tile vaulting. But for the top floor, we wanted good double curvature. And we did this Mexican technique, where you can just uh, build in arches from the corners. And this is just done with Adobe. And here's some images now being used. It's on the, uh, on the Ethiopian Institute of Architecture and Building Construction campus, with some nice details. We, um, uh, this was a model of a, a new kind of paradigm for construction for them, so we pushed everything to be natural. This is a fermented prickly pear cactus juice. Uh, this is, a, I heard, uh, one stage before an, uh, um, uh, a liquor equivalent to tequila. And apparently the anecdote goes that uh, people were maybe mixing their, their nice uh, they're nice uh, liquids and it, the barrel fell over and they noticed that the floor was impermeable from that point onwards. So they decided to start uh, smashing this onto buildings. This is a Mex Mexican technique. And we use this indeed to then waterproof the entire structure here. So this looks a little bit boxy, a little bit boring. That was exactly the point because uh, this was designed by an Ethiopian architect to make the point that actually a concrete looking box could be made with 90% uh, local materials. And uh, just to emphasize that um, the final cost of this structure was uh, less than 50 US dollars per square meter. So that, of course, capitalizes on using very cheap labor, but of also being based entirely on uh, local, uh, local materials. But at the end of the day, that means that you can basically compress anything uh, and uh, you can start to really construct things in waste. And this summer, if you happen to be in New York at the end of May, you'll see a pavilion that we will build just in compressed uh, paper. And perhaps here, I guess it also gets cold here. Uh, this is very new and I just show it uh, to, uh, uh, to tease a little bit, but we are uh, planning for next year to do a large shell out of uh, basically ice tiles. And so this would be, I think, uh, sorry, this is a silly intermezzo, but I'm looking forward to see a very large um, uh, 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 bar happening in the Swiss mountains uh, next year. All right, but perhaps more exciting is to now take this not to design with less material, but to design really expressive, like these beautiful structures of the Gothic. This was my first introduction to tile vaulting. Uh, to the right, you actually see uh, at the end uh, Michael Ramage at the end of his uh, MR at MIT, standing on the little prototype of only one centimeter of tile vault uh, at the end of uh, his master's uh, thesis or uh, project. And you see very convincingly, it's holding half a ton of MIT nerds. So I was quite impressed by that. And I thought that this, this is really something to look into. Um, then uh, Michael and John were uh, called to build this beautiful structure in uh, Dover. My name is not on the bottom, even though I'm convinced I used the tools that I developed for my master thesis, so I was a little bit annoyed. So I thought, OK, let's show my former advisor as first project at ETH that we can do things a little bit more excitingly. Um, so we use our tool RhinoVault to design something that has more surprising shapes. Tile vaulting key advantage is that you can build without scaffolding, but in this case we wanted to demonstrate a new kind of shape. So we needed a very descriptive kind of guide work to trace the geometry. But this guide work had ended up being almost a form work so that we then also pushed the bonds, the, the pattern such that we didn't always respect the stable sections to have more uh, flowing patterns, and this is Lara again building this shell.
There, we, there where we don't have good double curvature, we increase the depth of the structure so that we can uh, basically take the live loads. And then here you witness five and a half weeks of tile vaulting because it kept raining. But before getting there, one of the key things, because we were resting on the formwork, a funicular shell, meaning a compression-only shell, is most delicate when you decenter it, because decentering unevenly is the same as loading it heavily unevenly. So we had to come up with a decentering scheme that would do this nicely equally. So the, we devised this very high-tech system. To the left, you see cardboard dry. To the left, uh, to the right, cardboard wet. We tested this with flower pots. Seemed to be a grand idea. So we placed the entire structure on these spacers in plastic tubes. And after the five and a half week, we cut them open, put a hose in, and everything nicely came down. So success, we could safely decenter. And there it was standing, showing basically the first result uh, of what I developed for my PhD. So at least not a waste of four years of hard work. And uh, I enjoyed all the fights with my engineering colleagues that there had to be reinforcement and tension everywhere in this structure. This is an unreinforced two-layer tile shell of six centimeters and showing for the first time perhaps a new language that can be done with this uh, new kind of technique. So there it was standing because I branded it as a research project. I obviously had no permit. ETH was getting nervous because kids love to climb on it and particularly also roll off it in the weekend. So they got nervous. So it had to go, unfortunately. So as amateur master builder, we needed to do some sort of ghetto test. So here to the right, you see three and a half tons of sandbags in uh, quite a narrow patch load. Absolutely nothing happened, very disappointing because we had these very sophisticated uh, uh, measuring devices and we tried to then explain why that happened. Anyway, it needed to go. Oh, and I forgot. Can you hear this? This is Matthias, he developed Rhino Vault, so this was, an keep going, keep going. this was an exciting day to basically destroy our structure. I recommend to destroy everything you built at least once, because you really learn a lot from it. So we learned actually how resilient these kind of structures are. And here noticing this little hole, of course, didn't do anything. <laughs> Yeah, it's, um, it was an exciting day. So here temporarily, because of the bond, it's cantilevering a little bit, but not for long. So this is the local bending capacity. And then we keep hammering. So this is actually good to see, right? That even if it's unreinforced, this good double curvature makes this shell really not wanting to come down. Finish it, man. So still not coming down. And then at the end, highly appropriate that Matthias could do the final blow. And then some, uh, you'll see some nice project to seaplane for the Rhino users in the room. So after that, after this first, uh, this first opening uh, success, uh, we wanted to explore further what could this new language be. And so I wanted to bring back these, these ribs that we actually were missing, the ribs that we see in traditional tile vaulting. This was a first workshop in Sydney with Dave Pygram, where we, where we did in a 10-day workshop with students, we explored a new geometry of ribs in 3D with then traditional tile vaulting in between. And also Dave didn't buy sufficient sandbags, but maybe you, you noticed that we used a fairly expensive, we had a lot of foam uh, lying around, so we used all of that. That cannot be the point because one of the key aspects of tile vaulting is that you don't need any foam work. So in a second iteration in Melbourne, Melbourne uh, with uh, Tim Shark, we developed this uh, shell. And what's spe uh, specific uh, about this one is that even though you have a more an expressive form, there is a hard constraint that all the ribs are perfectly straight in plan. And that allows basically with an extremely st simple system of stud walls and simple profiles to build the ribs 
and then to patch with traditional faulting in between. So this is a combination between the expressiveness that we now can achieve thanks to our digital tools, but also the rigor and the constraints of respecting the construction and the efficiency of the construction. So this was again a 10-day workshop where I taught the students basically structures, masonry, the design tools, we did all the logistics and then we built it with them to basically uh, have a prototype. I had to leave a bit early so I missed the party which was a shame because I was very proud of the little uh, DJ booth that we designed but yeah, I had to go. Um, why I'm showing this project is because this is now, I see really a potential there for tile vaulting, not only as unreinforced, but also as lost formwork for very large concrete shells. And this is a project that we are doing in uh, Colombia, in Barranquilla, uh, with UTT, uh, Urban Think Tank, and my colleague Arno Schluter. And what we're designing is basically for an art school, an, a theater uh, space that is not only in compression, not only has these straight ribs so that we optimize uh, construction, but is also entirely optimized for acoustics. And so I'm excited there uh, to demonstrate the potential of these kind of things to basically address not only that we can find shapes that are more efficient, but that we can also build them more efficiently by bringing these kind of techniques back. So this is um, uh, waiting, expecting to be approved because the mayor wants us to start construction still in 2015. Let's see where, where, where that goes. Another little project was in Medellin in Colombia where the UN Habitat wanted to, us to demonstrate the flexibility of these kind of processes. Here just with bent rebar. This is a permanent installation in a park where we then also had a green roof on top. This is David, my PhD student, who had to deal in very harsh conditions, no electricity for the first week, using very rudimentary tools, having to constantly uh, try to motivate the workers not to be distracted. <laughs> but at least in this context, these workers being very creative, making uh, 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 an improvis uh, improvised tool from an improvised other tool. And then here, because this is permanent, we had to do the drainage, and this is then integrated in a park. It's not the most beautiful structure that we've done, but at least it seems that it is uh, very welcomed, and uh, at least the local uh, soccer girls seem to like uh, our structure. But the most exciting type of uh, masonry is the one where you have the full freedom of expression because you build it in full form work. So the first structure that uh, we did was this little one. It's only 40 centimeters, but it's uh, 3D printed without any glue and any connection. Certain parts are only two millimeters standing in compression. So this is a real structure by itself and showing that we are indeed not cheating. We started to push there where basically we designed the structure to have almost no compression. And of course, these kind of point loads are extreme compared to the, uh, the weight of this uh, lightweight shell. We also designed it such that basically we attracted the forces so that we have two separate kind of uh, structural shells. And that's something that you want to achieve in engineering, right? That the local collapse doesn't propagate in global collapse. Of course, unfortunate for the people on the left, but at least you didn't kill the people on the right. So that is, uh, that is something uh, to go for. All right, so there we go, exciting, but uh, a bit more challenging than what we did before, because if we have these stone vaults, one of the key things is how to cut up these stones, so stereotomy, and for this we developed an entire digital design process, and particularly you want all the interfaces to be as perpendicular as possible to the flow of forces, so that you don't have any sliding uh, during, uh, uh, during uh, its lifetime. All right, but then also because I'm building up towards a project we are doing in Austin, Texas, we also had to understand how to cut these stones. This is very precise, but about the most silly way to cut stone. You waste a lot of material, very time consuming, very expensive, you break a lot of tools. So the way to go is with these large blades and wire cutters. And then this is actually the machine that our client in Texas bought, a $1 million setup just to get this vault built. Very exciting. So we started to play and understand how it worked. And one of the most challenging things in three-dimensional milling is the referencing of the piece when you flip it. So we wanted to optimize the entire process. And here we devised with our uh, local partner, Escobedo Construction, 
we found this way to leave these, these pieces so that we could have these marks that we know both in physical and in virtual world where they are. And so you could just flip them without having to rescan the piece, regenerate the G-code, and then with the same precision being able to cut the top part. Okay, all sounds great. Uh, let's then continue and uh, write software to basically control this machine. Because surprisingly enough, these, uh, these softwares are pretty banal and we wanted to really show and demonstrate that if you control this process, you can really do things more efficiently. So here, this is the simulation and then we got to use uh, this machine. This is a quarter scale model of the project that I'll show you next. Where, where we are exactly trying these things. We're wasting a lot of materials here, that was Matthias, um, uh, because we just used some stones that we found, but we will also do some nesting optimization and work with the quarry to basically optimize these kind of stones. It's great to be able to work with such a partner that is happy to basically experiment and allow us to optimize these processes. So the more straight cuts you do, the more you optimize this. This project is in Austin, Texas. It's an, this is an old model. It's an amphitheater in cut stone, unreinforced with a main span in the front of 30 meters. And we will furthermore attempt to do it uh, dry in dry masonry. That is the, the one of the things that we set forward. Uh, just showing a little movie because this structural model we had to unfortunately glue to send to an exhibition because we didn't want the first uh, enthusiastic uh, visitor to make our structure collapse. So here showing a little bit that this was the initial form finding was done with uh, Rhino Vault. Again, this tool that we share for free. But this tool allows you to very carefully distribute, and this is what you see here, distribute the forces such that you can have features that are less kind of uh, obvious, like these opening edges at the end that welcome the people in. But as I said, we need to take from this solution the dominant force flow to align the tessellation, and then all these pieces are furthermore optimized to have straight cuts at the interfaces to significantly optimize the fabrication time. But then this is the exciting part. I had two MIT interns for the summer, so that meant I had uh, two model building slaves to assemble this four hour, uh, very exciting, I'm sure, three-dimensional three puzzle. We tested the decentering, very careful uh, uh, lowering, and this, uh, again, as I introduced in the beginning, this model will act very similarly uh, to the large structure. So here you see these flaring edges. For those of you who know Heinz Isler, that is his trademark in uh, uh, reinforced concrete or these beautiful kind of uh, droplet shapes. That is a trademark of Fry Otto, who unfortunately just passed away last week uh, in uh, tensile structures. And so we wanted to show all these beautiful shapes, but then really in unreinforced uh, masonry. All right, standing here, this is a little bit longer than I would like it to be, but let's wait for the next part because then we wanted to show that this was indeed a structural model. So this is equivalent to Godzilla jumping on one leg at the edge of our shell. John Oxendorf says that if you build in unreinforced masonry, then you build for 10,000 years, so he or she might come back, but if that is the case, then this beautiful thing might happen. I think this is extremely beautiful, but uh, of course we have an issue, right? That local collapse propagates in global collapse, so we basically worked on this shape to do this better. The client appreciated that this was a real structural model demonstrating that everything was standing in equilibrium, but asked nonetheless to send this uh, without this, this, to send this movie without this part because he was pretty sure that the city of Austin might not be as happy seeing this kind of uh, footage. Here, this is actually a shake test, but as everything is bigger in Texas, so perhaps also their foundations, there is absolutely no chance of an earthquake in Austin. So uh, otherwise, if we would build this in San Francisco, again, this beautiful situation might uh, occur. Um, just to say that these are the methods that we uh, uh, apply. I'm now saying it jokingly. Of course, we learn a lot from these models and I just uh, show here because of the beauty of the collapse. 
So this was a model that was at the Venice Biennale, surprisingly enough, in an exhibition by Zadit Architects on shell structures. And we were very humbled to be asked as a reference to uh, their ambitions and their idea of future work. I focus on form finding. I focus on finding these good geometries, but I wanted to say that, of course, and I don't bother you with this in this or bore you with this in the lecture. There is a lot of engineering behind it as well. We check every type of very extreme loading case. We keep all these compression solutions within the middle third of our section. That is how we've defined the thickness. And we redesigned the shell to basically have no global collapse. So actually what happened in this model is that we moved away the entire the entire support here, which seemed to be a pretty bad idea, and indeed only that part collapsed. So we are really developing new tools to understand new kind of shapes. So this seems to this project still seems to be happening. That is very exciting. If if not, then at least we built probably the most expensive doghouse in the world. This is a nice little shell, uh, and we won. I can say very proudly, Barkitecture 2011. Um, but uh, if you are in Boston, uh, one application is already, this we did with ODB. John Oxendorf is the lead designer here, designed by Mi Jin Yun. This is a memorial for the MIT officer that was shot after the Boston uh, bombings. And this is uh, right next to the Stada Center on the MIT campus. This is now being realized in unreinforced granite. So here you see the structural model. With to the left, my two partners, John and Matt. Uh, John doing a severe tilt test, showing what would happen in a severe earthquake. And this is from a month ago, being assembled. The walls are coming in, and this was yesterday on my way to the, no, not yesterday, uh, Saturday on, the way, on my way to the airport. This is the current state, so in a couple of, uh, weeks this should be inaugurated and so I hope you can then witness a beautiful unreinforced structure on campus. So what I showed you is basically how we learn from the historic master builders and then basically take this understanding and try to uh, extend it in uh, new ways from very high-tech ways to very low-tech in an African condition and then but I particularly also like the one in the to the bottom right because that combines basically the new possibility of digital tools with still the crafts, still the, the manual, still the, the, the skill in there. Um, I want to emphasize that I've shown you now masonry. I just finished my tenure track and uh, I wanted to be very consistent, but not only that, I love the aspects of showing with a traditional, a low quality, a boring material, what you can do uh, when you uh, extend this with new kind of techniques. But also we specialized as Joe started in computational methods. So I also wanted to demonstrate and validate our tools. Because if you do something stupid in masonry, it will collapse on you. If you do something stupid in another material, there might always be a little bit of bending capacity left and right that helps you out. And so this is a very dramatic model to show that we perhaps know what we're doing. But if you allow me, I'll take five, ten more minutes uh, to show you how we can learn from this beyond masonry. Particularly, for example, designing uh, vaults with very little or low quality materials. We already applied these kind of ideas in, in an Ethiopian concept, but now extending this to our building context. And to the bottom right, you see actually um, an unreinforced concrete shell floor. But of course, you can only achieve these kind of ideas if you really control the trust, if you allow this arch action to happen. And uh, the prototype that we built, actually for a project uh, in Zurich, is an unreinforced concrete shell, basically designed as a concrete, uh, as a doubly curved funicular shell with then these stiffeners. So it's basically a three-dimensional version of what the Guastavinos did as what we did in, um, in, uh, in, in Ethiopia. So where are we coming from? In basically reacting to the reality that most in most parts of the world, we go to 25, 30 centimeters of concrete just to keep the tension cord away from the compression cord and to be able to take the bending. So if you don't need that and you're just span, oh, and then another important thing is that you need to protect the rebar from corrosion, from fire, so you add another three and a half, four centimeters of concrete that is only there for that specific purpose. So if you build something that activates the compression that therefore doesn't need any 
steel, you basically can go as thin as you dare to go. And that is what we are doing in this project, saving more than 70% of material. The 70% is compared to the holo, holo core concrete floor, is basically the same weight of a, a wooden uh, floor system. This is entirely designed up to building codes because this project goes on construction in January 2016. We do this with a two-sided mold. This is just a fallback option. We are working on more efficient ways to prefab this structure. This is the bottom, so you see the slightly curved, and on the top you see the stiffeners uh, to take the live loads. So basically what we're doing here is the shell is optimized for the self-weight and the dead load, and the stiffeners take all live load conditions uh, basically in compression, in pure compression to the supports. So here you see that we actually uh, lay out the shell such. You see this kind of arch action happening in plan also to basically be able to uh, achieve this thinness uh, of the structure. Another application to design uh, how to learn from the equilibrium analysis of historic masonry vaults. For this, I'll show you an example of a shell structure. Well, this is a nice shell structure. This is a Pringle carrying 500 times its self-weight in a very bad loading condition, just to show you what good double curvature means, but also some examples. Here, when we look to projects like Felix Candela, spanning 30 meters with only four centimeters of reinforced concrete, or a modern Candela shell, just to address that even with our modern building codes, you can go as thin as six centimeters. This is in uh, steel fiber reinforced, and then this impressive project by Jörg Schleich, um, spanning 26 meters with only one centimeter of glass fiber reinforced concrete. So that is sensational. That is what you can do when you combine knowing where the forces want to go, plus also have a good double curvature. But perhaps one of the reasons that we don't see many shell structures anymore is because it is extremely expensive to build these things. To the right, we have the optimized system of Candela where he stuck to high power surfaces so, the, so that he could use straight rulers to build his geometries. But to the left, more modern structures like the Kermatoria by uh, Toyo Ito, very complex, very expensive to make these kind of doubly curved formworks. And we developed for that an, an, an extension, a combination of a cable net together with a fabric. The cable net is the false work and the fabric is basically the shuddering to basically build um, concrete shells. What is the relation to the equilibrium analysis of historic structures? Well, it's actually this step. The third step is that we first do shell optimization, so we find the best geometry possible. And then we need to support this structure just with a cable net. So what we do is the inverse as what we do in masonry. In masonry, we need to find a compression-only solution that balances the weight. Here we need to find a tension-only solution that balances the weight, what is the weight to wet concrete. And more importantly, we use the flexibility of the formwork to basically, we have algorithms that calculate a non-uniform pre-camber so that under the weight of the concrete, it hits exactly this target. So we use the flexibility to have more geometry control. Sounds good in theory, so we try this in, a pro, in several prototypes using the cutting patterns like in uh, textile structures because the beautiful thing about architectural concrete is that whatever you pour it on, you see everything. So the detailing of this expression of the concrete is very important. This is, of course, not a compression-only shell, so we use these new types of textile reinforcements. And this is it uh, just before decentering. And what was exciting about uh, this uh, shell is that it, even though it is only two meters by two meters, it is only three millimeters off the design value. And you can believe me or not, but this is building up to another project that we're building in Zurich. And the client requires us to be within five millimeters. And again, we are going in construction in January. So if I'm uh, trying to cheat and tell you whatever, then I'm cheating myself because then we'll get in trouble uh, soon enough. Then, of course, as structural nerds, we need to stand on our little thing. But the exciting thing, perhaps you noticed that I have some uh, very special friends in Austin, Texas, so we, I also took these ideas there to do things bigger, and more importantly, to see what could it be in a real situation. So using, maybe you recognize the yellow preps from uh, the Perry formwork system, only one custom piece, one cut piece, and all the rest is standard formwork and scaffolding. And there also geometry and force control. 
looking at the details. This is using a very cheap geotextile. So one of the advantages of building like this is that basically you externalize all the supports. So you free up underneath. So imagine, for example, for a highway bridge, you can just span up the phone work and you can continue driving under it. Or in this case, we actually optimize the building process to already start the finishes on the inside while the concrete shell is hardening out on the outside. Um, working with very skilled uh, Mexican laborers in Austin, this was pretty humbling and interesting with carbon fiber reinforcement. This is actually three hours before they finish this beautiful surface. And then here, the, uh, this little uh, uh, prototype going from two centimeters thickness to eight centimeters to have a little bit more complexity than the shell we did before. And this nice tension between the expression of the fabric and the clear precision there where you need it, there where you, for example, want to connect to a steel profile or a window or something like that. But then more importantly, when you go up close, you feel a very unique texture, almost a snakeskin kind of texture. And all this is for this project, which we are doing. I was lucky to be invited by a research institute in, in Switzerland that built this basically platform, these platforms to insert innovation in construction. And this is a render of the project that we submitted uh, to uh, the city uh, a couple of weeks ago. And this large doubly curved shell with an average thickness of six centimeters um, is bi will be built with this cable net fabric formwork. And the in-between floor is basically this unreinforced shell. So it is a research and innovation unit. It's a demonstrator of these kind of ideas. And here you see a section of the thin shell with then uh, these extremely thin floors in between and uh, some of the patterns that we'll reveal. But for me, perhaps most ex excitingly, is that because we go so thin, that, allow, that, is, uh, that is a combination of new optimization methods, but also of a new way of constructing more precise, that we basically use this thin surface as a large radiator for a low energy heating and cooling exchange. This is done together with my colleague Arno Schluter. And to give you an idea is that our our um, shell roof will basically have uh, a two centimeters, then the, 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 uh, the low, low uh, temperature heating and cooling and hydronic system. What I mean by that is 18 degrees in the summer and 28 degrees uh, in the winter. Then we have uh, uh, some more insulation and we use the, uh, uh, sorry, um, Fle fle flexible fo photovoltaics on top to also catch uh, the energy. So we're really trying to show how we can, through innovation in construction and structures, really reduce the gray energy, the material all together, and really start to integrate basically other schemes and other uh, um, uh, specialties into a more integrated uh, design. I want to quickly come back to the floor because there also we are integrating several features. You saw the cavities that you had in the structural model. We use this to basically uh, give an answer to, for example, a context like in Singapore where they just layer all the functions. You have the structural beam, then you have the floor, then you have the heating, then you have the mechanical and so on and so on. And in high rises, we end up with one and a half to two meters of structural depth or of depth in between the floors. So by basically reducing this, we not only make it significantly lighter, but we also save one floor every third floor. So that means that we really get much more real estate. Okay, but let's look at designing more effective. I want, we wanted to get away of these kind of hobbit houses that we always go down to the ground. So uh, if you take an arch and you have two half arches that is balanced by one tension tie, let's now extend this concept in 3D. This is also available in Rhino Vault, where we both basically explore as free compression on the inside with one tension tie on the inside. So I call it double funicular, pure compression, pure tension. And also they're demonstrating that this works. We made a structural model, very extreme one, 3D printed, separate pieces, all mechanisms. This is not triangulated. So if this would be a stupid shape, it would for sure collapse. And so here you see an up close was very hard to assemble. And this is really just a structural model to show that we can extend these to new kind of shapes. And you probably see what is going to happen. All right.
uh, this is obviously not a good structure, but the idea here is that this is again the difference between form finding and uh, and engineering. If in, here in this situation, for the dead load or the design load, you have a structure that doesn't need any bending capacity. So what we are doing here is we're basically optimizing it to be very efficient in compression and tension, and you only need to stiffen for the live load cases. So that means that you basically can again reduce uh, the reinforcement significantly. Another example, again, balancing uh, uh, structures in 3D. And uh, we built the largest shell uh, actually at the ELEC, the former Fryotto Institute. There we did this project in four days with students. It was just slotted together, very simple system, wooden slots that were balanced by one cable, assembled very simply. And so here you see that this, these slotted together structures are balanced by this one cable. And this is basically not a real structure, but a structural model start standing in the gardens next to the other prototypes at ELEC. And then this is perhaps a bit dry, but I'm pretty proud that we extend graphical methods now to fully three-dimensional structures, extending their representations so that we can go to all kind of more spatial structures uh, using subdivision schemes to come to very expressive trees. And I see that I am kind of uh, pushing your patience a little bit. So luckily, this is my last slide. I not only put my website on there for blatant self-promotion, but also because we share all our work uh, quite uh, in detail. All our papers are online. So if you're interested in anything that I told you, and particularly any of the technical things, which I uh, didn't want to bore you with again, you can, uh, you can find them on our website. And uh, with that, I thank you for having come, for still being here, and I'm very happy to take any questions if you have some. Thank you.